This is Glenn Robinson, President of the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. I would like to welcome you to our newest edition of Quick Takes on International Affairs. Please enjoy this talk and do consider joining the World Affairs Council. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Newhouse. I am the Deputy Director at the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism, uh, which is a research center based at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. And I'm here today to talk about a very interesting and concerning topic, that of accelerationism. So my talk today is titled Accelerationism, the International Apocalyptic Doctrine That's Unifying the Far Right. Pretty concerning, right? Well, it's a very complicated topic, but hopefully we uh, can get through uh, some material today that'll help you better understand and better contextualize this threat, uh, what it means, how it affects parts of the world, and what we might actually be able to do about it. Uh, and so if you have heard nothing about accelerationism, what is it? what it is at its loosest, at its most broad, is basically just the desire to speed progress towards a societal breaking point or collapse. So right away, this is where the apocalyptic part of my talk comes in. The entire point of accelerationism is to put pressure on social divisions, on uh, different sorts of forces, all with the purpose of pushing towards this massive destruction of the status quo and of uh, society as we know it. So today I'll be talking about a very particular form of, of accelerationism because there are a couple. Uh, and the form I'll be talking about is referred to as insurrectionary accelerationism, which basically uh, centers around the use of small cell targeted terrorism or infiltration or influence campaigns to spark either revolutionary upheaval directly or to spark oppression and massive government overreach from state authorities. And the point of that, the point of sparking oppression is that insurrectionary accelerationists believe that through massive state oppression, they can then indirectly spark revolutionary upheaval and apocalyptic social destruction. Later in the 20th century, following World War II, there were a handful of additional um, very important accelerationist threads and figures who emerged. A couple of individuals who were very important in the establishment of insurrectionary uh, revolt and accelerationism were William Luther Pierce, who was the founder of a neo-Nazi group called the National Alliance. He was also author of the white supremacist slash accelerationist Bible called the Turner Diaries. And the Turner Diaries has become essentially something of like a meme slash a divine work within accelerationist groups in contemporary times. And uh, references to the Turner, Turner Diaries will pop up in a lot of different places and a lot of places that you that would uh, often be considered surprising to see something like that. Um, but when you see a reference to the Turner Diaries pop up in one way or another, it is a huge red flag for the presence of accelerationist thought. And the final person I'll mention here is a guy named James Mason. So James Mason is probably one of the most notorious neo-Nazis uh, ever to exist. He um, is most well known as the author of a series of newsletters that eventually got uh, compiled into a book called Siege. And what Siege did is it essentially um, built upon many of the literary works that were put out by Order of Nine Angles followers and established a set of tactics for undertaking accelerationist uh, revolt. And, and so what Siege ended up becoming, especially in the late 90s and into the 2000s, and even more so today in contemporary times, is that it uh, promoted this idea of terrorists, white supremacists, et cetera, breaking up into very, very, very small cells. We're talking one to three people max, spreading out over the, over, uh, the world, over the globe, and undertaking extremely small cell insurrectionary violence like mass shootings and terrorist attacks against infrastructure, not because he thought that those tax attacks would actually um, cause, uh, would actually like collapse a state themselves, but because he believed that those attacks would help cause conflict more broadly among different areas of society between the government and its people. Um, and he believed that this sort of runaway, um, sort of like chain reaction violence would eventually result in the race war and the apocalyptic accelerationist break that 
um, that he wanted and that he was advocating for. In modern times, uh, accelerationism, uh, as we know it today, really got its start on a web forum called Iron March. And so Iron March is incredibly important because during the time that it was up between 2011 and 2017, it became a basically the main town hall of hardcore national socialists and accelerationists. At the beginning, it brought together members of uh, groups such as the Nordic Resistance Movement based out of Scandinavia, Golden Dawn, which is a well, it was a political and activist fascist movement based in Greece, Casa Pound, which is a fascist group in Italy, and Blood and Honor, which is a UK and transnational group slash movement. Um, and so right at the beginning, Iron March was important because it brought together all of these disparate groups. And for the, really for the first time, these very geographically dispersed groups were networking and they became a pretty substantial, pretty, pretty uh, established network of accelerationists to the point that the boundaries between these groups started to fall away. Uh, and this is very important to consider, especially when we think about how we resist accelerationist violence later on. These groups, each of them became... Uh, less of a group unto themselves and more of a brand for a particular area or type of accelerationism. Uh, this idea that the network mattered more than the group was very was was increasingly innovated as um, Iron March continued to get uh, established during the 2010s. Um, at the uh, by the time Iron March was taken down in 2017, users had created several new groups uh, completely as a result of their networking activities on Iron March itself. National Action was created via, or was created by a couple of um, essentially moderators and administrators on Iron March who had also been active in the British National Party and the um, National Socialist scene in Britain and was really the first sort of Iron March originating group. Then came the Adamoff Division, which became what probably the most notorious terrorist extremist group coming out of Iron March. A couple others include Skydos, Skydos, which was a accelerationist group based in Lithuania, and then Antipodean Resistance, which was essentially the uh, equivalent of Adam Adamoff Division, but it was based out of Australia. So, as I mentioned before, this is the the important things to note about the iron march movement the iron march network of accelerationists is that it was distinctly transnational and it kick-started the convention of the mixing of members from various different groups so all of these people were in the same threads on iron march talking with each other strategizing sharing um, everything from propaganda to strategies for making bombs and so each of these groups was an individual brand but the members shared significant connections with other groups, and many of them also actually had dual or even triple membership in various groups. So uh, one of my main areas of research in this in the accelerationist movement is in the use of these brands, of these individual discrete groups, uh, as less so a sort of like dividing structural uh, strategy or stru structural tactic for the movement, but rather they are used mostly as ephemeral brands, as um, ways to recruit people, to uh, get their message out there, to get headlines again in the news. But at the end of the day, they are not what matters in understanding this movement. The network of people beyond those groups, the network of people that make up these groups and are constantly recreating them and reshaping them and renaming them, that is what matters uh, when we think about the threat posed by these extremists. The Iron March Network composed, uh, composed, composed and still to, to this day composes probably the uh, most violent network of accelerationists in the world. However, it's just one of them. Uh, alongside what, what I also call the Skull Mask Network, because of an aesthetic uh, an aesthetic um, trademark that I will talk about in a bit. There are several other accelerationist movements that are um, active throughout the world. So probably the, the second most infamous accelerationist network is the Boogaloo movement, um, which is essentially a, 
arose as sort of like a set of disgruntled militia members who were who were sick of militias not taking enough action uh and it rose into an overt revolutionary uh, accelerationist movement at um, as like a byproduct of those militia movements. Um, the Boogaloo movement has, in its explicit form, somewhat fallen away in recent months. However, those people, the people who compose the Boogaloo movement, many of them have rejoined Three Percenters, Oath Keepers, other sorts of national militias throughout the United States, and have taken their accelerationist ideas with them. So as the Boogaloo movement has faded away, militias have, in, have become increasingly revolutionary and increasingly accelerationist. Um, militant Maoists are an increasingly dangerous uh, movement of accelerationists. Many of them are, um, although there hasn't been a ton of overt violence taken in Western countries by militant Maoists, many of them showed up at Black Lives Matter rallies throughout the United States last year. And there are some concerns that these people could potentially serve as infiltrators in peaceful, uh, peaceful protests to escalate them to violence. Then I also list the Proud Boys and QAnon here, and I list them with, uh, with question marks because they're still pretty much open questions as to the extent of accelerationist influence within each of these movements. So for the Proud Boys, uh, for instance, the core group probably still to this day remains uh, on the uh, remains non-accelerationist. So mostly they remain a sort of like de facto pro-Trump paramilitary group. However, there is there are increasing signs that there have been some schisms within the group, including a couple of Telegram channels that have taken openly accelerationist and pro-fascist stances. Um, and these Telegram channels actually do have a pretty significant amount of influence within the broader Proud Boy network. So they should not be discounted just because they don't represent the core of the Proud Boys. And then finally, QAnon. QAnon for its entire existence has held at the beginning, at the center of its mythos, or the center of its canon, uh, a, and essentially a, a yearning for political violence against its enemies. Um, one of the core parts of the QAnon canon is this idea that uh, li liberal politicians and various other enemies will be summarily executed by someone. Usually it's the state authorities, but sometimes it isn't. And as time goes on and QAnon supporters um, may be feeling more uh, frustration with the fact that those uh, arrests and executions haven't happened yet, there is an increasing chance and increasing probability that accelerationist and revolutionary uh, influence will will fill in the gap and that, that QAnon supporters will become more and more activated. Um, and, and directed towards uh, revolutionary violence. So it's important to talk about accelerationism because it is a particularly unique extremist movement. Uh, and, and it's unique for a variety of reasons. First, accelerationism is a doctrine and a strategic framework. It is not an ideology. That means that it actually cuts across ideologies. You can have... Uh, there have been accelerations connected to, there have been far-right acceler accelerations connected to violent Maoists, connected th to communists, connected to Boogaloo people. Like there's there's this very much this, um, what we call coalitional nature of accelerationism that leads to these people and these movements making allies, uh, alliances of convenience all in the furtherance of this war against the modern world. Um, so basically each of these movements may not agree ideologically with one another, but they will make alliances with each other because they believe that they will ultimately come out on top after the apocalyptic break has happened. Um, as I've already mentioned before, specific groups are not as important as overarching networks. Uh, groups collapse and reform constantly, and this is actually a strategy both to throw off media coverage, to throw off government reaction, and also to spread ideas further and further. And then finally, groups branding is to entice new recruits, but does not always uh, reflect the actual beliefs of the group's members. So for instance, Order of Nine Angles Satanism is more of a branding strategy than actually a reflection of its inner, uh, of its true sort of nature. Order of Nine Angles is an occult accelerationist network and pathway, but it is not necessarily like a quote unquote true satanic network. Um, another example of this is Adam Offen Division's obsession with nuclear weapons. 
the nuclear weapons part of the Anamoffin division is much less important than the fact that they're an accelerationist, you know, pro-fascist movement. One of the most interesting parts and unique parts of accelerationism is its aesthetic. Uh, accelerationist movements often have very, very striking aesthetics and use very unique imagery. This means that the aesthetics of accelerationism are one of the best ways we have of actually understanding and identifying accelerationists in the wild. As I mentioned before, you can't identify based on ideology because accelerationism cuts across ideology. So what you can do is use aesthetic and, and visual markers to, to, to identify. Um, one of the clearest red flags for accelerationist influence is the appearance of skull masks among activists. So, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, uh, these skull masks in the wild, but for those who haven't, this is what it looks like. This is an Anawafen division, uh, membership photo. So this particular skull mask, and it should be noted, there are many different types of skull masks, but this particular one that is worn by these Anawafen members is the one that is most strongly associated with accelerationism. Uh, siege culture based on is a sort of set of aesthetics based on siegeism, uh, which is a sort of like movement doctrine taken straight from siege, James, James Mason's siege and, uh, siege, siege culture, the aesthetic, um, heavily emphasizes the promotion of violence, the glorification of violence, the, uh, promotion and the use of like very heavily militaristic visuals. Um, and this is one of the best examples of this. This is from a, th this, um, uh, Fourier Creek division propaganda poster was created by, uh, a propaganda artist who created art for a huge array of different groups and movements, uh, across the accelerationist spectrum. Uh, there is also a set of aesthetic movements that are all descended from the sort of like, uh, 1980s throwback movement called vaporwave. And so these are called fash wave, terror wave, and patriot wave. And each of these sort of innovates on vaporwave for, for a different, a slightly different purpose. So fash wave, as the name suggests, is essentially vaporwave for the promotion of fascism. Terror wave is vaporwave for the promotion of terrorism and terroristic violence. And then Patriot wave is a particular, uh, small schism off of terror wave, um, that promotes essentially Boogaloo revolutionary violence. So it was used by a Boogaloo sect, a Boogaloo group that actually called itself Patriot wave. Apocalyptic and nuclear imagery, uh, as you can see in this Fourier Creek division poster are also very common and are pretty good red flags for. Uh, the presence of accelerationism and then primitivism, the glorification of sort of like back to the earth, um, anti-technological, uh, anti-modern, uh, sentiment through the use of visuals is also very, um, common among accelerationist groups and movements. So in addition to this Fire Creek poster, I have a couple other examples of this. So this is an example of, uh, of terror wave. Um, the use of like VHS scan lines, uh, and the use of this sort of like glitchy font with the promotion of siege is a, um, very much a trademark of fash wave, terror wave. And then this is a, a compilation of Patriot wave, um, Patriot wave imagery, all of which similarly has those like VHS scan lines, a lot of which has the glitchy neon colors and all of which also um, promotes violence against the state. So accelerationism isn't just in theory. It has also been implemented in practice to pretty horrific and tragic ends. Um, so there are a, a pretty good, uh, there's been a, a pretty large set of confirmed accelerationist violence that's happened over the past couple of decades. Uh, I, in this, I'll only list a handful and I'll split it up by skull mask and boogaloo. So on the skull mask side, some of the mass shooters that have, um, perpetrated horrific attacks over the past 10 years have been directly linked to the, uh, neo-fascist, uh, neo-Nazi accelerationist network. These include Br Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch shooter, Patrick Crucius, who was directly inspired by Tarrant, uh, Robert Bowers, who 
was the Pittsburgh synagogue shooter, and Timothy Wilson, who was a, who was a member of the National Socialist Movement and also promoted the Boogaloo. Uh, he was the individual who was killed in FBI shootout in Missouri when he was on his way to attempt to bomb a hospital back in uh, early 2020, soon after the pandemic had started. On the Boogaloo side, in addition to Timothy Wilson, uh, Stephen Carrillo was a confirmed Boogaloo uh, adherent, and he murdered uh, to he allegedly murdered two um, uh, sheriffs, two police officers in California. And then the Michigan Wolverines in Michigan were a Boogaloo cell who are accused of uh, plotting to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. So what makes accelerationism so difficult to address? Why am I talking about it here? Why, do, why am I so concerned about it? So first, it's anti-ideological. A lot of conventional counterterrorism and, and uh, counter-extremism relies on ideological analysis. We can't rely on ideological groupings for accelerationism because it is latent within so many different ideologies. It cuts across ideologies. Accelerationism is also syncretic. It encompasses a, a, and pulls in references and learnings from a whole bunch of different extremist philosophies, extremist movements, religions, literature, and many of which are extraordinarily niche and are hard to recognize unless you're very, very deeply immersed in accelerationist rhetoric. It's very decentralized, and as a result, leaders are hard to identify. Uh, many are often in flux, and so leadership of specific brands can come and go and, and can change very quickly. It's also, as I've mentioned before, significantly networked adherence from many different groups intermix in uh, encrypted chats and on um, Telegram channels, and they share tactics, propaganda, uh, and often will actually share membership with various different groups. And then finally, one of the core uh, tactics within accelerationist uh, movements is strategic infiltration. So uh, accelerationists will actually join non-accelerationist movements specifically to escalate them to revolutionary violence. Uh, this happens quite a bit. It happened actually in the Anamothan division itself. Uh, and it has happened elsewhere too. There are, there are many researchers who believe it's currently happening in the Proud Boys um, and even possibly within QAnon. So what can, we, what can we do to actually address this? Well, mapping out the networks that I've talked about throughout this talk helps solve for adversarial tactics like uh, the, the creation of groups that actually don't have any substance to them solely to throw off media coverage. Uh, and it can also work to address the root cause, the... Um, the actual uh, sort of set of individuals who are creating these groups. So whereas designating a single group like Adam Waffen Division can't get at the, the broader network, if you actually map out the network and try to uh, take action against that instead of the groups, you will have a much better time of, of preventing the groups from reforming and reorganizing like they always have been. Cooperation across social platforms is also extremely important for pushing back against accelerationist influence. These actors will often exploit um, gaps in social media monitoring to uh, actually propagandize and recruit new people. Um, they walk the lines of content moderation very effectively. And so cooperation ac across social platforms to take down um, these accelerationists and to use network analysis to do it is very important for uh, resisting accelerationist violence. And then finally, transnational connections can actually be used as leverage for domestic enforcement. So while taking action against domestic terrorists and domestic extremists is very difficult, especially, you know, especially in the United States, the fact that these are such transnational networks means that uh, the um, linkages between, say, like the Russian imperial movement and the Anamoffin division can potentially be used to give more, more um, political leeway for undertaking action against these extremists and mitigating them. Uh, that use of transnational connections is also a good way of, of disrupting global networks rather than trying to play whack-a-mole with designating groups. So accelerationists in some, in conclusion, 
pose a very unique and very novel challenge for for counterterrorism and counterextremism professionals across the world. However, there are some things that we know that we can do and, and some things that we have started working on already. So network, network mapping for one of them uh, is, is probably the best, the single best thing that we can do. We absolutely need to move on from this uh, uh, exclusive focus on individual groups and start looking at the broader transnational map of all of these different accelerationists, how they interact with each other and how they cooperate. And if we can get there, then it will be a very good start for actually mitigating this long term. That's it for my talk. Thanks so much for listening.